Right then, Jules. Well, thank you very much for coming on board and, and doing this. I know you're obviously very, very busy uh, in the lockdown, keeping up training. I've got so many questions that people have sent me. Um, I'm going to start basically by by just, say, just uh, saying that you and I became very, very friendly and very close uh, during the Dubai Duty Free Tennis Championships. Uh, Jules, just for, just for the rest, the rest of you, uh, every time it seemed you know, would come and help with the kids days when we had over thousands of kids coming to, to do the kids days and every time Jules came it was just amazing Jules and Horia uh, we put a picture of Horia here as well his, his incredible doubles partner and uh, and yeah so uh, it was really you know we've become friends since then I string his rackets with uh, with Thierry who's also on board Jules I don't know if you saw him I think Thierry's here somewhere He's here somewhere. I haven't, I haven't seen he's it. There, there he is. So there you go, Thierry. Um, so yeah, we we Jules said he'd be willing to come and do a, uh, I don't know, a quarantining uh, Q and A. So thanks very much for people who have joined. Uh, Justin, if you would like to ask the first question of Jules, we can start. Excellent. Okay. Hi, Jules. Hi, Justin. How are you? It's good to meet you this way. I'm it's great to meet you too as well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Paul asked me to send a, a, quite a few questions, and I know he sent them through to you. But I, I wouldn't expect you to answer all of them, but I guess the general theme is, I, I wonder if you can tell us what it's like to turn um, a passion as a kid and turn it into a, a, a mechanism of work. How How is your approach to your tennis in terms of running yourself as a business compared to what it was like just, just enjoying playing as a kid? Yeah, well, it's. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting question because the. So for me, I started off playing when I was when I was six years old, and when I was twelve, I knew that I wanted to play tennis, that I wanted to do it and become a professional. But being from Curacao, we don't have a tennis-rich culture. I didn't really know what that means. I just knew, you know, I saw like a couple of matches on TV. I used to watch Stefan Edberg on TV, and a couple of times when they would show the tournaments on TV. And then I had the dream or the idea of of. Uh, turning professional so when I was 13 I left my family I left Curacao to go to Miami where I met a coach and then started taking up um, tennis more seriously when I was 13 and, and I had left to, to go live in, in another country <clears throat> but I say that to say that uh, I didn't uh, the business side of the sport for me it didn't kick in until way later because my path was 13 to 17. I played in the ITFs, all the junior events and that kind of stuff. Then from 18 to 21, I took the route of going to university. Uh, so I went to UCLA where I studied for three years uh, before turning professional. So it's not just uh, it's not just a good look. It's a lot of brains here as well, guys, by the way. <laughs> uh, no, but but um, so then I took that path. So until I started really when I was 21, 22, when I had to finance my own way, obviously with a lot of help also of my family, the business aspect of the sport didn't kick in until I was maybe 22 years old where I realized, hey, you know, like <laughs> a dollar saved, a dollar earned, and, and you got to watch all of your, you do your budgeting. Um, so I, I un not unfortunately, but I had to deal with that at a much later stage than what players usually tend to deal with that because in the ITFs, I was given grants to join the ITF touring teams and I was always one of the top juniors. So I got stuff paid for and a little scholarship here and there. And then I went to university where I had a full scholarship. So financially that took a bit of a burden off of my family, but it still didn't, it didn't make me aware of what it really took to play tennis and how expensive it is and, and, and the difficulties in, in, you know, financing, let's say your way through a professional career. But in saying that, I will say that what's helped me a lot is from 13, well, from six pretty much, but 13 where I took it more seriously to 21, 22. Let's say from six to 21, 22 till now, but especially 20, it's, it was all passion. There was no passion versus business or it, there was no thinking business wise for me. I knew I wanted to make it, whatever that meant, because I'm a kid from Curacao and my dreams only carried so far. Um, but making it for me was just living the lifestyle of being on tour. Um, see, you know, having like at that time it was Mercedes Benz, the official car, pick you up at the airport or going to the nice hotels in the cities, playing in cities such as Rome, Madrid, Monte Carlo, 
tournaments that have been around for a long time. That was my, my, my making it. I just wanted to be able to live that stuff that I would see on TV. Um, but sorry, getting back to your point, um, I think the number one thing <clears throat> that carried me through is the passion. Luckily, uh, I, I love tennis. Uh, people are like, man, it, and I can tell you so many stories of stuff that I've been through. And people are like, man, that's such a you know, big, big sacrifice to do all that stuff. And I remember reading a Dutch, like a, 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 from a book from our Dutch Olympic champions. And it said, one guy quoted, it was a skater. And he quoted, I didn't sacrifice a day of my life. It just took what it took. And that's kind of, that's kind of my, my, it just took what it took. I would do it all over again because I was so into it and I'm so passionate about it that I'd never really focused on that struggle. But I can tell you that this financial struggle or the business side of it is real because from 22 onwards, now I'm having to really budget. I go from living three years in the nicest places in, in LA and everything paid for to, uh, here you go, buddy. You have X amount to spend for a week. And now go figure out where your meals come from, where you're going to stay, how many people you're going to room with per week in a tournament, um, how we travel to, to everything comes into play, you know. Um, and then if you transition a little bit uh, later to where I'm at now, it's super important to try to budget your way through this whole thing because it's an expensive sport, unfortunately. And where you can get help and where people help you, as was my family, as I am towards others, be very thankful of that. Um, I say that not because we're on this chat, but I remember going to Dubai. You could say that I'm self, uh, let's say not self-made, but that I'm made already at this point in my career. But then I get help from guys like Steve and Paul. And, Lisa, and th that's help that you appreciate throughout because those are the guys that you need along the way. Because if it's not for me, maybe they touched me late. But if they can touch a younger generation or younger kids earlier, those are the people that you need in your way to make a kid's dream come true. So uh, I don't know if I answered your question exactly, and I went a little bit all over the place, but yeah, I didn't have to deal with the budgeting side of it, but I know that part is real, and I know it's really difficult uh, until later in my career. And honestly, I wish I would have had it when I was 14, 15, 16, because it probably could have served me better. But until the day of today, I have to watch um, how many weeks a year I take my coach because I need to pay him a fee. I travel with a physio full-time because I'm 38 years old and I need a physio to look after my body. So I pay that guy full-time. I have a wife that if she doesn't travel with me, I don't see her. So she needs to go along as well. Then I, it's just, it's a whole bunch of stuff and, and it's, uh, it's really unique and it's a crash course in, in finances and, and especially in budgeting, which is, I think, super, super important uh, as you navigate through this thing. Cheers, Jules. Thanks a lot for that. Like, like um, my brother, we both believe that kids have got to love the sport before anything else. And I think you've sort of proven that today. I'll, I'll switch my mic to mute and let somebody else have a go. Cheers, bud. Yeah, and I'll keep it short because I know the time keeps sticking quick on these things. The passion uh, for the kids that are, that are, I didn't just somewhat like tennis. I didn't just, uh, oh yeah, I really like to play. No, no, I love tennis. I, I would do what I just mentioned. I would do everything that I did to make it in the sport. I would do it all over again. Um, so the passion, I think parents, if you see that the kid's passionate about it and it, it doesn't have to be tennis, we're talking tennis here, but my number one lesson, I'm from a small Island in Curacao, 150,000 people. I'm not saying that to make my story greater, but people don't make it in tennis out of this, out of the Caribbean or out of these islands. And the number one thing that I carry in my back pocket is my passion for the sport. I think if parents recognize that in your kids, then by all means, do everything you can to support that kid, whether it's painting, music, whatever it is, have the kid be supported and feel loved in that direction because the passion is the number one most difficult thing to find. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. Right. Okay, so moving on. Next question. You might be able to see two lovely young ladies with a, with a blue sign behind them and a dog flapping away. Um, in there. Oh, wait, now that she one's just gone. This is from uh, from Alison and Nick in uh, in li near Liverpool, Jules. Uh, they want me to ask the question, so I will. Uh, All right. Do you think that men's and women's tennis, the WTA and the ATP, should join together? Uh, that's a very good question, and of course, this was raised now recently by maybe Roger and Roth or somebody mentioned this, um, and I think. I have to be honest, initially I thought my, my stance would be that it should be separate, but 
I think it totally should be merged together in one product. I think you make tennis stronger in that sense. I think most of the other sports, if I'm not confused, their leagues are separated. It's either the guys' leagues, it's the NBA and the WNBA. It's the men's soccer national team and the women's soccer national team. And it's everybody has their, their, their you know, like their separate leagues. And I think tennis can do itself a real big favor by merging these, these two together, uh, the, the men and the women tour, the WTA and ATP tour, by merging together. And then I think we would come together with a much stronger or better product um, in general. But, and, and it's an easier sell as well. When we're talking about um, TV rights and these things, if, if you sell the package as one, then the women don't have to compete with the men in this case, because at the moment, the men's product is a little bit stronger. But there were years also when Sharapova and Serena and, and the women's products are stronger. So we don't have to kind of leech off each other. If you just merge them together, you could sell the package, the TV, the tickets, the, all the rights. It, it just goes a little bit smoother. And I think, I think it's a good look. I think it's the way the, the world is, is going and, and, and the direction we're going in. And I think it's important to, to again, give equal importance to those, uh, you know, to, to, to both um, associations, let's say, and have them merge and be one product. I think both sides will benefit a little bit because the men's product right now is so strong that the women will benefit from that. But the men also benefit because the women's side have um, a couple of young stars coming up as well that are good and, you know, they're talked about and they're advertised and their, co their courts are packed and they're must-see players. And so I think the merger um, is actually a really positive thing. And I'll tell you what's really funny because I discussed this with a popular player yesterday. I don't want to mention his name because I don't want to just throw his name in there. But let's say one of the top, you know, five players in the world. I was discussing with him yesterday. And he was saying, it's funny how now because of this epidemic, probably the people's opinion changed a lot on this. Where if we didn't slow down to stop and maybe go through a financial crisis or have tennis taken away from you, that we would just continue on with, hey, the ATP is the ATP, the WTA is the WTA. But funny enough, because of this kind of, and, and that's happened for me because now I have a little bit more time to think and, and look at the different options and look at the different um, things they bring to the table and come up with a better opinion. Whereas if I would be in my regular schedule and preparation and tournaments and all the stuff that I have to do, then I would just stick with, no, we're the ATP and they're the WTA and we just keep on going and let's keep on going. Um, but, I, but I'm at the point where I don't think, I, I think the merger is a good point. Like Billie Jean King, uh, mentioned also she she mentioned this maybe 40 years ago already but maybe it was I, I don't know what the, what the difficulties were then to to merge them together but I think now is the time and I think it's a good move to to become one and have a stronger product and tennis would do itself a big favor in terms of it would be the leading sport of, of just meshing the men and the women together no other sport I don't think has done that or not on a such a global scale so I think I think that would be good Okay, fantastic. And then actually, there's there's a double double edged one on this one because I think it's probably probably currently the the most talked about topic in tennis right now, and uh, that's what um, Dominic Team has come out and said about the the things. Do you want to have your say on that? Yeah, I was very surprised that Team took that stance, to be honest. Um, and of course, um, he's a top player. He's probably been through the ranks as well, from lower ranked player and make his way up. Um, and there are some players, sure, that that uh, that maybe don't take it as seriously or they do it more as a hobby or just to play and to get a couple of points and see how far they can go. But then there are players like my very, very good friend because we came up from the same region and I know how difficult he's had it and what he's been through. A player like Dustin Brown that I think most of you will be familiar with. He posted something that, hey, if, you know, he lived out of a camper for many years. And he strung rackets for $5 a pop for the other players out of his camper. And he drove for hours from it with his inside sleeping his camper from one tournament to the next. If, um, if we take the approach that Dominic team would have in this case, like, like Dreddy, as we call him, like Dreddy says, then his dream would have never been realized. And that's also unfair because he's had some amazing moments and has put together a pretty cool career. So I think in this case, we have to be very wary of, um, I'm, I'm a top, let's say, 20. I, I'm, I'm ranked individually 20 in the doubles game now. But I can't take the approach of not worrying about the other guys that are, that are 80, 90, or 100. I was at some point 80, 90, or 100. Um, and I know that if this were to happen when I was ranked, if I'm ranked at that spot, 
then I would like the help or I would need the help rather. Um, getting back to the, to the finance side of things. So I think it's super important that, uh, I, I don't like to see that stance. I, I tend to disagree with Dominique in this point um, because I think the world, I think we need to move in a different direction. I think we need to help each other out and lend a hand, which is if anything, this epidemic, it, it's proven to us, this is the way uh, forward. We need to lend a hand and, and help the others uh, to, to, to go forward in life and to get through stuff. And right now, those bottom-ranked players, they really need the help. Some of these guys will have to quit tennis because they don't have the finances. And when they start back playing up again, they're playing future tournaments where you earn, you know, $100, $200. Unfortunately, if you lose first round. When I played one of my first ATP tournaments um, that I got into was the finals in L.A. when they used to have the tournament in my alma mater, UCLA. And I played there and I made finals. And I, rem I don't remember what I made exactly, maybe like three grand. The following week, because my ranking didn't allow me to get into all of the tournaments at that point, I played a tournament in Vancouver, and I lost the following week in a challenger, which is a very nice challenger and a big one in Vancouver, and I think I earned $234. I took that receipt and I put it on my fridge for motivation. It just shows that how one week you can go from earning three grand to earning $200. So I think it's, a, it's an important matter. Uh, I think what the, what the other guys, Novak, Roger, Rafa, or the ATP and the Grand Slams, what they're trying to do is to create a fund to, to fund the, the, the other players. And I think that's quite important at this moment. Brilliant. Steve, have you got anything you want to want to throw in before I go to Paul Baker? Well, no, no, no. Just keep going with the guys. Okay, Paul, time. do you want to take yourself off uh, mute and ask your question? Yep, perfect. Yep. Oh. Hey, so uh, my question is, do, uh, do you think that doubles is promoted enough worldwide? And should we do more to promote tennis as a team game after seeing the success from competitions like Labour Cup, etc.? Yeah, very good. The same conversation. Good, very good questions. <clears throat> I have a group chat with this top player that's in it and two other very good friends of mine that one is a top coach. He's coaching one of the best players also. And one of them is a, is a person that's on, on you know, on, on the ATP that has a good position. So um, we were discussing this exactly. I think to answer your first question, doubles absolutely needs to be advertised more. And not because I'm now an older player at 38 uh, playing just doubles. I think doubles in the U.S., for example, many, many um, clubs, they only play doubles, these older people, and they like to come out and watch doubles. I think it's less maybe in Europe the case. But I know also as you get older, I think the older people that play doubles, they tend to like to watch doubles. And quite honestly, I've played against every single <clears throat> player you can imagine, singles, doubles, whatever. Um, some of the guys don't, some of the singles players don't have very good double skills. Some of the doubles guys, I'll give you a guy that everybody on this panel probably is aware of or knows, or a guy like Jamie Murray, <clears throat> he's extremely skilled in doubles. I mean, he's, he's, he's really like a, we, we always call him double specialist, but he really specializes in doubles. And his skill set is so much better than some of those singles guys playing doubles. And to me, that's, that's awesome to watch, you know, and that's really, I think we should promote it a lot more. I think um, it, it should be advertised more. It should be on social media here through, by the ATP. Um, part of the conversation we're having yesterday uh, said just that. I asked him the new CEO, because now the ATP has a new CEO as of December already. And I said, are we going to, you know, try to advertise the sport in general, but also doubles with the sport in general a bit more? Because I even think with the, with the stars we have at the top right now, we can be a bigger sport even. And, we, we, you know, we, we should be one of the top sports in percentages and in, 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 in money earned and in, in viewership and all this stuff. At least that's, that's my belief. Uh, it's tough to compete with soccer and a couple of these other massive sports. But um, I think it's important. I think we can do a better job now. I must say the ATP, they found a new uh, media team that's handling the social media, and that's an improvement. It's not where we need to be yet, but that's an improvement, and that's a, that's a part that we need to invest in and make sure we get really some, maybe some, maybe some startup guys, some, some young tech guys that, that have creative, uh, innovative ideas to, to lead the way because we need that. Tennis, we can't just keep with the same old boring system and boring matches and boring stuff, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think it should be. Steve, you and I should jump on that, shouldn't we? <laughs> yeah, except we can't edit. I'm going to recommend you guys to the ATP media team. I, I think you should. <laughs> I think you should, Jules. Right. Thank you very much, Paul. I'm going to ask. We've. Yeah, I, I don't know if you can see Jules, but there's a chat. 
Um, and some of the guys are actually asking questions on the chat. I don't know if you can see on your computer. So we've got Paul Sheaves there. Paul, if you want to come on and unmute yourself and ask your question, that'd be great. Hi, uh, I'm not sure if this is working. Is this working? It is, Paul. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, so I, I love I love doubles, and I just wanted to ask um, what your basic doubles strategy is going into you know the average ATP match on tour. What's your sort of starting strategy when you go on court? Um, so, so sorry, when I go on tour, meaning um, when I start in a particular match or when I first went on tour? When you're on court about to play a match, what right. strategy is in your head? I know it's specific to your opponents, but yes. in general. So, so uh, in general, so uh, a bit of a loaded question. I like it uh, in, in because many angles you can go. It's very specific to your opponents, of course, because you're going to create a strategy to play to their weakness, obviously to your strength and their weakness. So that, that'll yeah. change. But I think the most important thing in the doubles is to, for example, I play with a really powerful, powerful player uh, in Horia Takao. And our strategy before every match, that's what we talk about, is how, what plays are we going to run to hold our serve? If we can hold our serve, and eventually we're going to get a crack at, at breaking serve at some point in the set or in the match, and then hopefully win that set or the match. But if we can hold serve consistently, then we're doing well. Um, and then more specifically to your question is we have plays that we run a lot and the opponents sometimes know that they're coming, but there are strength. There are best, you know, there, there, there are, there are plays. And I'm a believer. And that's a, and that, this gets very tricky because in doubles, it varies a lot. There's players that play strictly to the weakness of the opponent, and there are players that play to their strength, regardless of if it's to the strength of the opponent. Um, so we're the kind of team that we play to our strength all the time. Sometimes it bites us in the butt, but we play to what we think is going to win us the point. And if their best is better than what we can bring, better than our best, then so be it. There's, there's something that we like to call a double play in doubles. I like using it a lot. Um, Pete Sampras used to do that a lot when he played in the singles matches. He would play Agassi. He serves Agassi to the forehand. Agassi smokes a return by him. Um, okay, great. When, so when Pete gets another chance to serve to that same side, very likely he's going back to the forehand because he's such a competitive guy and he knows that his serve is better than Agassi's return. So he's going to go back to that play, almost calling Agassi's bluff, saying, well, I know I can hit that serve there again. Can you hit that return there again? Um, and Pete was a master at that, and that showed ultimate confidence in his game when he played. He always went to double plays when he was serving. Um, I, had the, I had the luxury, I mean, the privilege of practicing with Pete the last three years um, of, of him being on tour, and it was so clear. His confidence was so high, and he loved the double play. He if you had a good return off his serve, he's challenging you on the very next serve to the same side. And that's kind of what we like to do in doubles, Horia and I. We play to our strength. A lot of the guys, especially on the ad side, they know what play I'm going to run. But I'm confident that if I'm running that play well, then we're going to win, you know, seven out of ten, eight out of ten points. Um, so the strategies there is to plan to your strength always and then worry about your opponent's weakness. Have the confidence that your strength is going to outdo um, your opponent's weakness. I don't know if that answers the questions, but unless you wanted it more specific, but let me know. Yeah, so like, at what point then do you switch your, your strategy of going for your strengths? At what point do you switch it for going to their weakness? Yeah, well, you switch it. You switch it when you just got clobbered six two in that set. <laughs> yeah, or, you know, or or if you lost serve a couple times and that's not working, because then it becomes you can't be stubborn and go through the match and lose your match. You have to then adapt. But you start off the match with your strategy. It's like a very, and it depends because everybody has different mentality, but that's certainly our mentality. It's a little bit of a boxing strategy. I'm going to come in and have a certain strategy. Now you get punched in the mouth or in the face a few times, or I'm going to reassess my strategy because I don't want to get kept hit in the face. Um, it's kind of a same thing that, that, that Hori and I do. And I can also say, I don't want to confuse this conversation a bit, but some of the coaches that we've been working with our coaches, the last six, seven months, they have told us that we need more variety in our games because then we've been losing a lot of matches in super tie breaks. And then they claim that it's a lack of variety because the opponents then haven't seen enough different plays to keep them off balance because we're living and dying with our strength. So then in a big moment, 8-8, eight, eight, 
seven seven in the super tie breaks. These people know exactly what's coming, and then they can maybe hurt us with it, you know. But then again, our good has to be better than than what they've got. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Going to move on to um, Magali because we're getting with, even though I told people to do this beforehand, Jules, they're still coming in thick and fast now. The questions, but and but guys. No just to let you know, we are on a we are on a bit of a schedule. Jules has got a prior engagement as well. So, Magali, if you can go on to the next one, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so, how difficult is for the players to survive financially on only doubles? Yeah. Uh, on the tour. Yes, yeah, it's uh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Um, man, the stuff that we have to go through to to slowly but surely, there's more prize money being put in double. So when I started playing singles, it wasn't really an option. When I started playing singles, this is now many years back, um, the singles players also play the doubles, but it's just to get more practice and more of this kind of stuff. Nowadays, the doubles guys, it, it's, eh, it's, it's <laughs> difficult because now we've had more prize money pumped into the doubles. So when I played and I didn't make it in singles, it wasn't a clear decision for me to say, you know what, let me um, make a doubles career, or go and make a career out of doubles because it wasn't promoted back then and there wasn't enough money in it back then. Nowadays, there's a little bit more money in it and I can, if I'm a younger player and I see that singles is not making it or it's difficult and I have a skill set like I did, I was a servant volley player. Well, that's gone out of style, but servant volley is really successful or helpful in the doubles game. So then I, I made a transition, luckily, Luckily, through a friend of mine that called me because I gave up at that moment on tennis and my dream about, and a friend called me to play doubles, but it wasn't an, an option because there was no money in it. Nowadays, there's more money in it. And so you have that option at least to go and play doubles. And what I tell players all the time, work on your overall game. When I went to college, it really hurt my singles game, but it really helped my doubles game because we did a lot of doubles drills. The doubles point back then was still important in, in college. We did a lot of exercises. I kept working on my game. I didn't volley well before I went to college, but I volleyed well once I left college. So that gave me my second career. Because of my willingness to keep on working on my game and, 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 and developing, that gave me a second career, which I'm really thankful for. And it gave me what I talked about in the beginning, my dream of, of playing and, and being picked up in those official cars and staying in nice hotels and playing in big cities. It gave me that dream just because I worked on my overall game. But to your specific question, it's extremely difficult. I think you would have to be, I'm going to say, top 75 to be self-sustainable in doubles. Otherwise, it's very difficult. If you're at 100, it's very difficult. Um, there's not enough money at the, at the lower end of that. So I'm talking about 100 and, and going back. So if you're going to make it in doubles, I had this very clear, then you better be one of the top 20, 30 uh, doubles teams if you want to make a good living uh, playing doubles. But Hopefully, and, and through what we talked about earlier, the advertising, advertisement and the promotion of doubles, hopefully it gets, it gets a little bit... Um, my mom's coming in waving to see if I want to go for lunch. Okay. Go for lunch. Um, hopefully, um, it takes that away. You know, hopefully, we get more advertisement, more publicity, more money towards doubles, and that way um, people can, can... I'm working with that with the Dutch Federation, for example, to make them aware that these kids can make a career out of doubles nowadays because there's enough money in doubles. This wasn't the case before. 10, 15 years ago, this wasn't the case. So, um, but, it, it, but it's difficult. So, so we had to budget, like we talked about earlier. Um, sometimes I stayed with three, four people in a hotel room. I always ate at the club because if the club provided food, then I always found a way to either eat there, uh, get a ticket, get a ticket through a friend to eat at the club. All of these things you have to do to kind of survive on tour. Um, but hopefully we're moving a little bit away from that. And as for a ranking, I think if you're between, you know, if you're in the top 70, then you're self-sustainable where you can play and, and, and you know, yeah, play, play doubles full-time on tour. Thanks, Magali. Right. Thanks. So, Jules, we're going to move to one of our younger ones in the middle of Canada, in, the, in uh, Toronto, I believe. Anissa, do you want to ask your question? Hi. Um... Um, my question is, what's your craziest experience on court? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, good, uh, good question there. That, that, that's caught me off guard. 
And I like your shirt. I like your sweater. Um, my craziest experience on court. Um, Almost embarrassing. So, yeah, I'll tell you what. It's not because I can't think of something embarrassing or really funny that's happened. But I think this is pretty crazy. So the year we won Wimbledon in 2015. And that year in the second round, we were, yeah, there we are there in the top. <laughs> in, in the second round of Wimbledon that year, I mean, it's not, it's not funny for them. It's really funny for me. It wasn't funny at the, mo at the time. We were playing our second round opponents. And we, so it's the best of five sets in Wimbledon. We lost the first two sets. And then we're down in the third set. And we're down so badly, actually, we're match point behind in the third set. I'm serving. Second serve, 30-40, match point for the other ones. I push my serve in. My opponent returns to me. I come in, and I just push the volley back in play because I'm so nervous, and I don't want to miss the ball, and it's match point. So if I miss this point, then we lose. I push the ball back in play. My opponent slips and falls down and can't hit the ball back. And that's how we saved match point that year which was, I think, really funny for us, not so funny for them. But my opponent, literally, if he's on his feet, he would stand up and crush that ball and probably win the match. He slips and falls down on the grass and then tries to flail at it and get the ball back, but he can't. And that's how we saved match points in the second round, and then we went on to win it. So I could have never been Wimbledon champion. I could have been out in the second round, but thanks to a guy slipping and falling on a big moment, that, uh, that you know, led to some nice things. Thank you, Anissa. Okay, I'm gonna, so, I'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind. See if I can come with a funny story of, of something that's happened. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, I like that question. Sergio, are you able to come online? I know you've got a great question you you sent to me. Can you uh, unmute yourself? Yep. Uh, hey, Jules. How you doing? I, sorry, my camera's not working very well. But we hit at the door one time. I don't remember. But anyway, yeah. I remember uh, that. <laughs> Uh, just a question of mine. Uh, the question I have is, let's say your forehand is stronger. Do you play on the forehand side or would you play on, let's say, the backhand side uh, so you can cover that, that middle serve with the forehand, which is probably the harder return to do? So if your forehand is stronger, you said? Yeah. So let's say your forehand return is stronger. Would you play on, let's say, the juice side or would you play on the ad side Maybe with the idea that the ad side, the serve down the middle, trying to hit that at a return, maybe the more difficult Man, one. I wish I had a clear answer for you. But what I can tell you is that most players that have a really, really good forehand, they like to play on the ad side. But okay. it, also, it also depends because on the ad side, the reason they like it is because they can run around and hit the forehand. Many players like to run around that ad side and hit the forehand. But... This goes both ways because if you have a good forehand, you can put the guy on the do side and he's going to make a return, whether with the forehand or backhand. And every shot almost that comes back after that is going to be a forehand for him. But the players that I'm mentioning, the Jack Sox, the Mark Lopez, guys that have really big forehands, they play on the ad side and they run around and hit that forehand all day long. So for the, from my experiences, the guys that have the bigger forehand, they seem to be taking the ad side for whatever reason. But that's the side that they choose. All right, cool. Thank you for that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, you got it. Right, okay. So Steve? Uh, who should we go for? Andy Styles. If you want to unmute yourself. Is he still here? Yeah, yeah I'm still here, mate. Um, oh, just yeah. outside of tennis, what other sports uh, do you follow, if, if any, and what do you do outside of tennis to keep your mind active and um, just keep your mind off the, the sporting that you're, you're, you're getting on with? Um, I, I, yeah, I keep my mind off of my sport with sports. I'm the biggest sports nut probably in this. Uh, the, the only thing I have to say, I'm terrible with, with football. Which is, which is the number one sport in the world, but I watch everything else. I grew up playing everything else on the islands here. We have great athletes. Baseball is our number one sport. Um, so I grew up playing a lot of baseball, but my, I have an older brother. We did Taekwondo. I swam. I played baseball, um, obviously tennis. We, I did a little bit of everything. And, and I think for the young kids that are watching or parents that have kids, have your kids, when they're young, play as many sports as they can. Only positive stuff can happen. Hand-eye coordination, your motor skills. Just have them play and let, and let them enjoy. But um, I, uh, I watch sports all day long. You know what I actually spend my time on? My wife hates it. 
But when I come home and I'm tired or after a match, I watch these. Have you seen these debate talk shows that like two guys on opposite ends and they always seem to have opposite opinions of each other and they go back and forth, back and forth. I, I watch, I sit and watch that on sports all day long. It's, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, but it's, it's also, it's been good to me because it's made me also some money tra trans, uh, because I'm, I pay so much attention. For example, the year that LeBron James came to play for the Miami Heat, I was following the whole thing and I got an insider from a buddy of mine that's in real estate that he was looking for homes in Miami. So then I went to the American Airlines Arena where the Miami Heat play and I ended up buying a box along with a couple of good friends of mine in the Miami Heat um, Arena. So we had a, a, a we had a pretty much front row seats for for LeBron James's four years in Miami. So then my wife didn't complain as much anymore because all of a sudden we can go to those games and it was a good investment all, all, all in all. But um, I, I watch everything, man. I, I watch sports. I play sports. I love it. I, I'm, a, I'm the biggest sports guy ever. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Right. The, before, what we're, I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Thierry, who you know very well, Jules. Uh, and then we've got some, Steve and I have got some quick fire questions before we send you on your way and, and whatnot. So, so Thierry, if you want to come on, on uh, unmute. Yeah, Jules, great seeing you again, and uh, yeah. I hope you're keeping well. Um, my question is, is, is maybe simple, but every week you've got a different guy stringing your racket, right? I mean, you have different tournament, different stringing teams. What, what's the most important thing to you and, 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 and the pros in terms of going on court with a great racket? What, what's the key, key things you're looking for? Key thing is consistency. I can tell you that from every player. I don't have to think about that. Consistency. If you string a racket of a certain way, whether it's done well or not, or you pull the third string or whatever happens, the key thing is consistent. Then the next time, do it in the same machine with the same care, with clamping the strings the same way, pulling the strings the same way. The consistency is what drives players nuts. The top players in the world, Andy, uh, Roger, Novak, I don't think Rafa does, but Novak, these guys travel with P1. Uh, they're a company that um, they, they do the weight and balance and the stringing service for a lot of professionals. These guys travel with those guys. That's how important the tool, the equipment is to these players. Um, they have their own stringers travel with them worldwide to all these tournaments so they can get that consistency on the racket. Um, it's really important that if I'm at a tournament and I hand my racket to somebody and I go and practice, the next time that I hand in my racket that that same stringer does it, not somebody else. And within that same stringer doing it, also the same technique or the same way that he or she did it before should be done on that racket. So the consistency is key. I think that's the number one thing players would, would go for. Excellent. Good, man. Thanks. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Jerry. Right, Steve, should we, should we go through our, our quick fire ones? Because, like I said, we're going to lose Jules very soon. Jules, I've got one question which, which I do want to get asked because when, when this person asked this question to me today, I was, I was dumbstruck. So, Alicia, would you like to ask your question, please? <laughs> question. Hi, Jules. Hi, Alicia, how are you? Very good. Jules, during your free time. Oh, you... Hang on. I heard it during my free time. <laughs> I can still hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. During your free time, you prefer to play basketball or Batman? Oh, man, that's a good question. Um, so, basketball. Um, to answer, I mean, back to Andy's question. Well, basketball is my, my I, I can't because I'm, I'm just not skilled enough and fast and tall and jump high enough. Basketball is my, my favorite sport. That's what I choose to play. But I love Pac-Man. Like if, in Rotterdam, in the Rotterdam tournament, every time there's a Pac-Man machine, like one of those big ones. I went to look at it to, to buy one and put it in my house. I'm playing Pac-Man all the time when I'm off the court there. If I finish practice or a match, I'm on the Pac-Man. Everybody has to walk by because the restaurant, to get to the restaurant, you have to pass the Pac-Man machine. And every player, their coach, everybody makes a comment on me because I'm on that machine for hours. Um, I, would probably, I would probably choose basketball because I'm actually getting a sweat and a bit of a workout in. And I'm shooting and I'm moving around. So I would probably choose basketball. But, man, I love my Pac-Man. <laughs> Steven. Steven. All right, Jules, you need to settle the debates for everybody very quickly. 
who's the greatest, Federer, Nadal, or Djokovic? Novak. <sighs> Why? Uh, Novak, because I believe that tennis, when it's played at its highest form, when everybody's in shape and it's played at its highest capacity, then there's nobody like the pinball machine himself, uh, Novak. Um, no weaknesses. Um, Notice one thing when Novak plays, that it's a small, it's not a small thing, it's a big thing. But when Roger gets nervous, he shanks a lot of balls. That back and side can break. I mean, Roger is, God, he's, he's unbelievable. He's been great for tennis. But Roger, he can shank a lot of balls. He can, he, he, his, his, he can maybe not, yeah, not meet the ball as clean because he's accelerating so fast. Rafa, when he gets nervous, he starts playing really short in the box. You've seen it plenty of times with the forehand. It's short, it's short. When these guys get nervous, they, they both have weaknesses. Novak gets nervous, and he's playing about a meter away from the baseline on an average rally shot. That's his nervous shot. Um, it's, it's spectacular. The guy holds his nerve. He's mentally tough. He has their numbers, both those guys. Um, people were saying that Roger, in the last couple of years, have played better tennis than he played earlier in his career. Well, Novak's been beating him for those years that he's been playing better tennis. I personally don't think, I think the best Roger we saw was 2003, 4, 5. That Roger, to me, is, is better than this Roger. But those guys in their prime, Novak just has their numbers. He's just better. He's just better. It sucks to say, I like Roger and Rafa better than Novak, but Novak's a better player. So he's the guy you were chatting to yesterday on your phone. No, he's not. No. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, quickly, I'll ask, I'll ask one then, which is, uh, which result hurts you the most? Um, which result hurt me the most? Um, oh, there's not one result that stands out. I'll tell you, so I, I wish I had that one direct. Uh, the first three semifinals that I made in doubles, I lost to the Bryan brothers, all three in doubles. Um, and that kind of... Uh, it was tough because that made me realize that, hey, you're playing in the era with these guys. Maybe if I didn't, maybe I would have more Grand Slams. But those guys are going to be around, so you better either get better, find a way to beat them, hang in there till they get older, whatever, whatever it takes. But, but those, those are tough losses because they're in the semifinals of big tournaments. And, um, and that they, they stick with me. And the other one that really bothers me, I pride myself on my Davis Cup record. I play for the Netherlands, uh, which is... Obviously, Curacao is a Dutch island that's owned by, by, by Holland. Uh, and the last three Davis Cup ties for me, I've lost. Uh, last year in Madrid, we lost to the English guys, Murray Skupski. And then we lost another one to Bublik and Kukushkin. Uh, those were both decisive matches. When you're playing for, whether it's your country and the team involved, and every, it just hurts so much more, man. And th those losses are actually what motivates me now during this period because I feel like I let everybody down and it really sucks. Thank you. Steve? If you could play with any retired doubles player, who would it be? It would be Woodbridge, without a doubt. Um, because, it's because, it's, it's, because he's the best doubles player we've ever seen. He, he, I think individually he's the best doubles player. So, so I would love to play with him, get a lot of knowledge from him. Um, He's so skilled, so smart, so good, holds so many records. Uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be Todd Woodbridge. Would you put him above um, McEnroe? Yes. Yeah. And, and, and the statistics and the numbers show, and, and I would. Fascinating. Okay. Um, I've got, I've got a, a, a strange one for you, but you might, you, might not, you might not get it. So, right, you're stuck on a desert island with the big four. Yes. Okay. And you have to you have to decide you have to assume a role for each one of them, okay? So you can have the hunter, so the one who gets the food, the chef, the one who makes the food, the entertainer, Stephen, um, headmaster, in other words, the guy who's the educator, and the handyman. Who's out of all five of you? Who does what role? You. So let me. I don't know if everybody else in this chat got that. There, I'm stuck on the thing with the big four, but there's about eight qualities you threw out there. I, there's only five <laughs> qualities. Okay, okay. Were they five qualities? Um, man, I'm see if I can hold all five in my small brain that's been inactive now. For he a said while. he went to university and he was smart. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so the sh the big four, the big four meaning Roger, Rafa, Andy, uh, Novak. 
well, I've got to include Andy. This is a Brit mostly British people on this, so come on, he's Andy, on the pod. Um, um, Rafa being Spanish? Uh, no, because Rafa can be between the chef and the cook. Uh, sorry, the hunter and the and the chef. Because um, Rafa, I would probably want Rafa hunting, man, because that guy's going to let me down. Um, <laughs> Because and Rafa could be the chef also. They eat good food in Spain and he loves to cook. I know that. Um, but be, if we're stuck on an island, then I'm gonna need the food to be caught first. So I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send I'm gonna send Rafa to catch the food. Um, well, it was one was a mastermind or a strategist or somebody that's uh, like a, the head the, the the headmaster the educator. The educator is gonna be Andy. Andy's edu and Andy's one of the smarter individuals I know. Problem solver. That's how he plays tennis. He outthinks the room. Super clever. It's the educator is going to be Andy, and then I have what left. You've now got chef, entertainer, and handyman. I'm not going to want to be eating Serbian food, um, <laughs> so I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. <laughs> Sorry for that, anybody in the chat. But I'm going to I'm going to leave then um, Roger to do the the cooking. Hopefully he's had some good experiences in his life and can 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 cook. And I'm gonna put I'm gonna put Novak as the entertainer. I honestly thought you'd put Andy as the entertainer. No, no, Andy's the thinker. Andy's by Andy's the thinker. Okay. There's not between those guys, there's not a question in my mind. Andy's the thinker. Okay. And so you're the handyman, are you? And then unfortunately for them, I'm the handyman. <laughs> Okay, Stephen, we just got around about cool. five minutes, Stephen. So over to you. Well, should we do our quick fire questions for Jules? Yeah. About five minutes. Oh, okay. that he knows. So, Jules, we're going to ask you 20 questions. Woo. Okay, you've got to answer as fast as you can. You'll only probably have two, maybe three options. So, I mean, I'm trying to. You see how much I'm talking? Try not to mess this up. Answering quick. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Should we take turns, Pest? Yeah, go for your life. You go first, I'll, then I'll take the second one. Okay. Indoor or outdoor? Outdoor. Movie or dining out? Dining out. Coffee or tea? Tea. Good on you. Uh, grass or hard? Hard. Selfie or autograph? Autograph. God, I hate selfies. <laughs> uh, New York or London? London. Big hands or big feet? Big hands. I'm worried. If, if Steve's going this route, I'm worried now. Yeah, yeah, come on, <laughs> Steve. I went with big hands, too. So I don't even slip on that stuff. Okay. <laughs> Dogs or cats? Dogs. Man. Instagram or Facebook? Neither. Um, Instagram, Instagram. <laughs> you can say neither. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Good man. Brunette or blondes? Brunette. Hello, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I see the brunette with the white, with the white shirt there. Uh, br br brunette. <laughs> Sorry. Morning person or evening person? Evening. Shaven or unshaven? Shaven. Yeah. Unfortunately, during quarantine, but shaven. Snakes or spiders? Oh, man. Um, spiders. Wimbledon or US? Wimbledon. Good answer. <laughs> he's, he's got to say that. He won it. He hasn't won. Oh, yeah, he won the US as well. Damn it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. uh, milk chocolate or dark chocolate? Can I elaborate on this one quickly? Please. Uh, <laughs> normally milk chocolate here in Curacao, we eat these little, it's a Dutch thing. We eat these sprinkles, chocolate sprinkles. And I've always had them in milk chocolate, but lately we've been buying them in dark chocolate and they're amazing. So I'm a bit stuck on that one, but normally milk chocolate. <laughs> I'm eating so many of these things here. It's just awful. Oh, last one from me. Describe yourself in three words. Intelligent. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Unshaven. Yeah. I would say, uh, is, is it? Oh, I'm terrible at that stuff. I don't know. I don't value yeah. myself. That I, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, three words. I know you hate this. I would say one of them is going to be discipline. Um, 
One of them is going to be, oh, man. Elian loves these questions. She's, she's, I bet you she can give me three words right now off the bat. Well, she uh, should answer. Should we, should we, should we get Elian on, to answer that question? Three, yeah, three, can we? I would like to know. Can we? Yeah, Elian, can you go on, can you go on uh, unmute? And Elian, can you, can you unmute yourself words? and describe, three, describe me in three words? Okay, I'll say discipline, big heart, um, always happy. Oh, I can't say that about myself. Love. That's lovely. Right, okay, so uh, Jules has got to go. He's got, he's got a very important uh, uh, commitment to go to. Uh, I, I actually just want to ask one last question because the British guys amongst here would really, I'm sure they'd be interested in this. You won, you, won the, uh, you won Wimbledon doubles, obviously, in 2015, which was just amazing. Um, do, do you get like a little pass or something? Are you, you're now a member of the All England Club? No, unfortunately, only the singles winner become a full-time member of the club. Um, but because I because I know a few people there, I'm trying to get my membership, anyways. But uh, but but, I, but you don't become a member by winning the doubles. But you do get. So if you make, have you guys heard of the last eight, the final eight club? Um, so the final eight club is a it's a very nice gesture. I think tennis got it right with that. So for the rest of your life, the final eight is if you've made in the singles, men or women, singles, quarterfinals, doubles, semifinals mixed doubles finals then you aut automatically belong to the final eight club the final eight club they send you tickets the rest of your life to go to wimbledon and you get a pass credential these things so you get an invite every year for the rest of your life to wherever you're a member of the final eight club of um so uh, for me like a, a really nice thing was my parents went uh, a few years back to to wimbledon to watch they've only been twice for the wimbledon finals was the first time they went and another year where they had to do some operations, some procedures in, in Holland, and they made a small trip to London. And then we went and visited the uh, the final eight club. And it's it's a nice little office there where you get food, drinks and stuff. You don't have to pay. The members go in um, and you get tickets to watch the matches. So it's a really nice thing. And uh, and all the Grand Slams, all four of them have uh, a final eight club. So you, you get that. Thank you. That's brilliant. Okay, guys, everyone can come off mute. All I'm going to do is say, Jules, I just can't thank you enough. You are absolutely the greatest, uh, certainly the greatest professional I've ever met. And I can't thank you enough for the time that you spent. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks a lot, guys. I talk a lot, so I hope you got to answer everybody's questions because I rambled on and I, you know. Thank you. It was great. Thank you for helping. Thank you very much, Jules. Thanks. Bye. Take Bye. care. Anissa, I, w I wish thank I you. had a better answer to your question. I'm going to think about it and forward it. <laughs> Thanks, Jules. Take care, Eliane. Lots Bye. of love as well. Love Bye, to have you on the Bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.